Let's go ahead and start with a prayer. Our God and Father in heaven, we thank you for this day. We thank you for all that you've blessed us with and for uh, keeping us safe and healthy and, and taking care of, of our needs. We pray that we would always put you first and that we would seek to glorify you in all things. Uh, please be with your people and with the world at this time uh, in all of the, the trouble and uncertainty that we would cling to you and that this would be uh, removed uh, as a burden from us soon. Please be with us as we strive to serve you. Help us to be faithful in all that we do. In Jesus' name, amen. We often stress as we study the Bible and as we, uh, we, we preach and teach the possibility of apostasy and the need for us to be faithful to God and to not throw away the salvation that we have. That is a very needed emphasis. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 6 through 12, it says, Now these things took place as examples for us, that we might not desire evil as they did. Do not be idolaters, as some of them were. As it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. We must not indulge in sexual immorality, as some of them did. And 23,000 fell in a single day. We must not put Christ to the test, as some of them did and were destroyed by serpents, nor grumble, as some of them did and were destroyed by the destroyer. Now these things happened to them as an example, but they were written down for our instruction on whom the end of the ages has come. Therefore, let anyone who thinks that he stands take heed lest he fall. We have all these examples from Scripture, Old and New Testament alike, about how God's people need to remain faithful, how it is quite possible for us to take the good gift that we have from God and to throw it all away. Think about what we're talking about in our Jeremiah class uh, that Judah is in that situation, that they think we are God's people, we have everything uh, that God has promised us, he's going to continue to bless us, and God is saying, no, you have rebelled against me, you have left me, you have betrayed me, I will destroy you because of it. Those things are examples for us, so that we will take heed lest we fall. In Hebrews chapter 3, verses 12 and 13, Take care, brothers, lest there be in any of you an evil, unbelieving heart, leading you to fall away from a living God. But exhort one another every day, as long as it is called today, that none of you may be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. And that's Satan's strategy, to use sin to deceive us into thinking that everything is okay, that we can have God and sin, and there be no consequences to that. And of course, we know that's not the case. We emphasize that. We stress that, that we must be faithful. We must purge sin from our lives. However, it is also possible for us to overemphasize that need for faithfulness, which maybe sounds like a strange thing for me to say, but follow me here, to overemphasize this to the point that we start treating salvation as a roll of the dice, as something that is inherently fragile and that we have no real expectation of. What is the foundation that we have in being able to stand confidently before God? Is it right for me to say that I expect to be saved by God, that I expect to be in heaven with the Lord? Let's look first in Titus chapter 3, verses 4 through 7. We're going to put some pieces together here and see how a lot of these moving parts work together. Titus chapter 3, verses 4 through 7. But when the, the goodness and loving kindness of God our Savior appeared, he saved us, not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to his own mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us richly through Jesus Christ our Savior so that being justified by his grace, we might become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. This is the first foundation that we have to establish, the nature of God and how he looks down on us. I think there are some that think that God is looking down with skepticism or even malice and, and looking for an opportunity to destroy us, that he wants to see us fail, and that absolutely is not the case. God is a good and loving God. When the goodness and loving kindness of God our Savior appeared, he saved us. 
It is God's fervent desire that we succeed. It is God's fervent desire that we are with him, that we have fellowship with him, and that we are able to purge sin from our lives. He wants us to be justified by his grace and become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. Now, add on to this Jude verses 20 and 21. Jude 20 and 21. But you, beloved, building yourselves up in the most holy faith and praying in the Holy Spirit, keep yourselves in the love of God, waiting for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ that leads to eternal life. So we've taken God's desire, God's attitude toward us, that he loves us and wants us to succeed, and now we've added something else to it. This need for us to keep ourselves in the love of God. So there's a piece that we have to do. There's a responsibility that we have, uh, that when we build ourselves up in faith and praying in the Holy Spirit as we obey God's commands, we are, in essence, aligning our desire with God's desire. God wants us to be with him. I want to be with God. The pieces can move into place for that to happen. But there's still something missing. You take those two by themselves and you say, well, God wants Danny to be saved. Danny wants Danny to be saved. So God makes it happen. But God cannot just wave away sin. Sin doesn't just disappear because some time has passed or because God is no longer interested uh, in holding me responsible for it. A price needs to be paid and salvation needs to be accomplished through something. So we get to 1 John chapter 1, verses 5 through 10. 1 John chapter 1, verses 5 through 10. This is the message we have heard from him and proclaim to you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with him while we walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus his son cleanses us from all sin. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. So a lot happening there. We see the reality of our sin, the reality of our fall and the, the desire for God to bring us into the light. But notice what the missing piece is. The missing piece is the blood of Jesus, his son, which cleanses us from all sin. So God's desire is for me to be saved. My desire, it, it comes into line with that for me to be with God. But then it's the blood of Jesus that can cleanse me. It's the blood of Jesus that is able to wash me from my sins. So we see it all come together. But it's been a long time since Jesus came to the earth and a long time since the crucifixion. That is considered ancient history now. It's been 2,000 or so years uh, and we don't know how much longer the world will go on. The end may be imminent or we may have decades or centuries or millennia until Jesus returns or, or even longer, who knows? Who's to say? that God has not forgotten about his desire or that his desire has not changed? Will God keep his word and give what he has promised? There are a number of ways that we could answer this, but I want to use Ephesians chapter 1, verses 3 through 14 to show it. I think this is a tremendous passage which speaks of what God, Christ, and the Holy Spirit have done and are doing and will continue to do for us. Ephesians chapter 1, verses 3 through 14. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. In love he predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will to the praise of his glorious grace with which he has blessed us in the beloved. 
In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of his will, according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time, to unite all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. In him we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things, according to the counsel of his will, so that we who were the first to hope in Christ might be to the praise of his glory. In him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it, to the praise of his glory. Now this is a, a doxology that Paul starts with in his letter to the Ephesians, and there's a lot going on here. It's some complex sentence structure and a lot of, of doctrinally rich content here, and theologically rich content. Uh, you can spend a lot of time diving into each clause here, but I want to break it up in a relatively simple way for the purposes of this lesson. We have first in, the, in verses 1 through 6 about what God has done for us, God the Father, the predestination of us for adoption to himself, a son through Jesus Christ. Then in verses 7 through 12, we have what Christ did for us. And then in verses 13 and 14, we have what the Holy Spirit does. So I want to build this up for you and see that it's the same thing that we've already been talking about in this lesson. The predestination that God has, that's, that's a loaded word that has a lot of different ideas these days, uh, but it speaks simply to the eternal plan and eternal desire that God has had for us even before we existed, even before time. Uh, there's, there's a phrase in here about uh, verse 4, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world. So we generally think of things as you know, Genesis 1-1 is the beginning, and it, it is the beginning, but before the beginning, God was there. Before the beginning, God existed and God had already conceived in his mind what he was going to create. You know that you don't take God by surprise? That nothing you do is uh, the, this incredibly surprising thing to him? That he knows you. He knows your character. He knows the decisions you make. Uh, the, the fall of man was not a surprise to God. He knew it would happen. Yet he also knew that he desired for man to come to him. That he desired for there to be a reconciliation, even with that fall, for man to be able to have fellowship with him. And so with all that in mind, God still created the world. That was not a mistake. That was not God falling short in some way. He created the world. He created everything in it. He created us. And man fell. Genesis gives us the story of how uh, man fell, how sin entered the world, and we continue that fall as each one of us has brought sin into the world uh, and has fallen away from the Lord. Yet God's timeless and eternal desire is still for us to be with him. So for me to be able to bring my desire in line with him, there has to be what we already talked about, that salvation through the blood of Jesus. That's what we see as this goes on, that verse 7, in him, in Jesus Christ, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace. Again, this was God's plan from the beginning. The Father conceived of all of this before the fall ever happened. This is not some halfway measure. This is not God scrambling to figure out what to do. You know, right now in the world, there's a lot of uh, people and families and businesses and churches and governments who are scrambling to figure out what to do because everything changed. There, you know, we, we went into 2020 with all sorts of grand plans for what we were going to do, and they all blew up into a million pieces. I don't know anyone who was really ready for this. 
The fall of man was not that to God. God knew that would happen. God had a plan to bring us back from that. And so it's through Jesus, and, and you can follow the, the string, the pattern, all the way through the Bible, as everything that God does is in the interest of getting Jesus to the earth at just the right time. He guides, well, he first guides people to make the nation of Israel and protects Israel and guides them to grow and to have a place for Jesus to be. Then Jesus comes and he dies on the cross and, and his blood is shed so that the new covenant can begin and a church is established and we have the opportunity to come to Jesus. And so, again, my desires come in line with God's desires. It's the blood of Jesus that allows for that to be effective, and we have salvation in our grasp. And we come all the way back around to the question that we started with before we read this passage. Does God remember that? Or is God going to change his mind? Or has God already changed his mind? Do you know how often I change my mind? Do you know how often you change your mind? If you had 2,000 years to do something, how many times would you change your mind on what's best to do? That brings us to uh, verses 13 and 14 about the Holy Spirit's role in this. We have the seal with the promised Holy Spirit who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of that inheritance. The Holy Spirit seals us, marks us as the saved. Now that's another thing that people get uh, very, very fantastical ideas about. What is the seal of the Holy Spirit? Revelation talks about that too, right? Uh, you know, a, a mark that is put on you somehow. I don't know, do you glow a little bit? Do you have, uh, you know, perfectly clear skin now because the Holy Spirit has marked you? I don't know, what, what is it that the Holy Spirit does? Don't go looking for that mark on your body. Uh, it's not visible like that. You can't tell at a glance whether someone is a Christian, whether someone is one of God's saved. Really, this is analogous to another image used in Revelation, that of the book of life. It is God's record of who are his. God is not operating on whims. God is not just throwing different plans around to see what sticks. This plan is established. His plan for our salvation is set. And when you do what God has, has commanded you to do, then your name is put in the book of life. The Holy Spirit marks you with the seal, the guarantee of the inheritance. You think about what a seal was back in those days. It was something used typically by important people, by kings, by rulers, nobles, uh, to, to put on a decree or a letter or some kind of communication to show ownership and approval. So a king might write a decree and put his seal on it saying, this is mine. I take ownership of this and responsibility for it. This is a decree from the king. When you obey God, the Holy Spirit seals you and says, this is the guarantee that you are doing what God has commanded. And God will keep his end of the bargain. God will deliver. No matter how many years pass, no matter how long we have to wait until the judgment, God will not change his mind. God knows who you are. You have not gotten lost in the shuffle. If you've ever dealt with a bureaucracy in basically any form, then you can appreciate how valuable that is. But you're not going to get lost in the shuffle. You're not just a number to God to be forgotten, uh, to be dismissed, but that God knows you. Your name is recorded. Now, can that be undone? Sure. Revelation also talks about having names blotted out of the book of life. The seal can be removed. Uh, going back to what we're talking about in Jeremiah, those people who were God's people were throwing away that fellowship that they had with God, and so they were bringing uh, this, this punishment upon their own heads. We can do the same. 
And yes, we need to emphasize that. But so long as we obey, so long as we cling to God, we can have confidence in our salvation. This idea is talked about in other places in Scripture. It's not just uh, one random passage that I've found in Ephesians, and it's not just uh, from Revelation, which is a uh, you know, traditionally difficult book to understand. In 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 21 and 22, it is God who establishes, you, who establishes us with you in Christ and has anointed us and who has also put his seal on us and given us his spirit in our hearts as a guarantee. Down in chapter 5, verse 5, in 2 Corinthians again, he who has prepared us for this very thing is God who has given us the spirit as a guarantee. Galatians 4, 6 and 7, because you are sons, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, saying, crying, Abba, Father, so you are no longer a slave, but a son, and if a son, then an heir through God. As one of God's children, as one of the saved, you have the spirit as a guarantee, as a record of your obedience and God's promise. And so let us be filled with the Spirit. And I want to bring your attention back to an idea that we talked about earlier in this lesson. This idea of me bringing my desires in line with God's desires. If God desires for me to be saved, and I desire for me to be saved, what's well, good for those things to, come, uh, to become aligned with each other? But is that all that God desires? God desires a lot of things in my life. God wants me to behave in a certain way. Remember last week we talked about how God is the designer of beautiful things, that God has a pattern for how uh, our lives, our relationships, our social structures ought to be. And so God has this perfect plan for what I ought to do. This is about more than just salvation. This is about how I live my life. And so Galatians 5, 22 and 23 shows us what, what we have in the Spirit, what we have from the Spirit. More than just a guarantee, we also have a transformation, things that ought to develop in our lives. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. This is the kind of transformation that needs to take place in the heart of a Christian. You align yourself with God's desires. That not only affects what happens in the judgment, it affects what you do today. And so, the last passage for us to consider in 2 Peter chapter 1, we see this continual growth process, 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 5 through 11, for this very reason, make every effort to supplement your faith with virtue, and virtue with knowledge, and knowledge with self-control, and self-control with steadfastness, and steadfastness with godliness, and godliness with brotherly affection, and brotherly affection with love. For if these qualities are yours and are increasing, they keep you from being ineffective or unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. For whoever lacks these things is so nearsighted that he is blind, having forgotten that he was cleansed from his former sins. Therefore, brothers, be all the more diligent to confirm your calling and election, for if you practice these qualities, you will never fall. For in this way there will be richly provided for you an entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And you should see it all coming together right there at the end. That be diligent to confirm your calling and election, but also, it's not really about me. It's also about the way being richly provided. God wants to see you succeed. God wants to see you in fellowship with him. And he asked back in Jeremiah's day, uh, how can I pardon you? I want to pardon you, but how can I while well, you are still in rebellion? God asks the same thing today. How can I pardon you while you are still in rebellion? If you will align your desires with God's, he will pardon you. And you can have fellowship with him. Stand strong in your assurance by growing in your faith. I want to encourage you not to have a shallow understanding of two equally true facts. 
of two equally true principles. One, that, that our salvation is assured, that as we are obedient, that God will make good on his promise. Don't have a shallow understanding of that. Take that seriously and know that God is working to make good on his promise. But also don't have a shallow understanding on our need to be faithful, thinking that God is just going to dump salvation on me like a bucket of water uh, and I'll go through life having been drenched in the glory of God. It, it is going to take work. It is going to take me changing my desires. We put it all together. When God's desires and my desires are the same, then salvation can be relied on. Thank you for your attention. Consider these things. Uh, if you are not faithful to God, if you are not one of his children, then work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Read the scriptures. Look at what God has to tell you. Look at how he wants you to change your life. You too can be baptized and can have your sins washed away through the blood of Jesus Christ. And you can go through that transformative process of changing your thoughts, your actions, your behaviors, your very desires. If you are a Christian, if you are in God's kingdom, take comfort in it. Stand firmly in it. Your salvation is not a roll of a dice. God wants you to be saved. Stand assured. Thank you, brethren and friends. Be safe, God be with you, and Godspeed.